Hello everyone, welcome to the first episode of a new series I like to call What I Watched This Month. A video popped up on my recommended this last week called What I Read in July by the YouTuber Paperback Dreams, and I was like, okay, that, but, uh, with movies. Because I watch a good amount of films every month, not a ton, but, you know, enough. And I always want to talk about them on here and share them with you guys, but never really have a reason to. So, this is what that is, a just quick monthly recap of all the films I watched and my reviews for them. I also needed something to hold you guys over while I finished up my Synecdoche, New York video, so with all that out of the way, let's start. I kicked off the month with The Devil Wears Prada, a childhood classic for me. It wasn't my first time and probably won't be my last. Whenever I think of Meryl Streep, I think about this film for some reason. She gives a legitimately great and memorable performance. The music choices are way more obnoxious and unnecessary upon rewatching this, and there are a lot of stupid scenes here and there, but for the most part, this is a pretty harmless and fun time. Rosemary's Baby, directed by Roman Polanski, is a film I've been meaning to check out for a while because it's Rosemary's Baby. My favorite thing about it besides the poster is the fact that this thing is over two hours long and feels only one hour long. You really get sucked into this thing pretty fast and once you're in you cannot get out. The performances, if I even have to say anything, are phenomenal. Mia Farrow and John Cassavetes specifically. I really enjoyed it and would happily watch again. After that I watched an experimental film called Sleep Has Her House directed by Scott Barley. Uh, this thing is messed up. It's really just a movie from the perspective of a forest. It's kind of all I can say. If you watch this in the dark with headphones on you'll have have one of the craziest experiences, I promise, and I honestly don't recommend watching this in any other setting. A link to purchase and check it out is in the description below because that's pretty much all I can say and want to say about it. This is where you start hating me. I finally watched Space Jam for the first time, and it was a good time, more so than it was a good movie. Not a bad movie, just... Just weird. I mean, don't get me wrong, I am head over heels about the fact that this kind of thing was greenlit, but with a story like this, it was kind of gonna be ridiculous regardless. There are just some jokes that don't land and feel weirdly drawn out. The whole thing is very surreal. No hate towards the Space Jam fandom, I just definitely needed to be a kid to appreciate this a bit more. After that, I watched Anus Amour, a film by Maurice Piala. It was really good and I definitely loved it, but everything I loved about it can also be said about the next Piala film I watched called Naked Childhood. I loved this thing. It reminded me of the 400 Blows, but a bit more honest. Honest. The cinematography captured the setting in a really immersive way. It did a great job at capturing the nature of this town. Knowing Call Me By Your Name was somewhat influenced by Anu Zamor makes sense because they share a lot of the same traits in terms of a visual style. If you're looking for something short, hard hitting, and visually captivating, check out both of these on the Criterion channel. I then watched Speed Racer for the first time and I kinda loved it. This thing gets so much hate and I get it. It looks silly and sure it's like all green screen, but the way that they use it is super creative and just sick in my opinion. You know, it's like there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. It's when you look at this compared to Spy Kids 3D This is clearly like a masterpiece How I'm looking at this is that they took every opportunity They had to use the visuals in a creative way and just went bananas with it to see a live-action film Share the same creative qualities of an animated film is super rare and Speed Racer just nailed it Even if it doesn't look great all the time, you can't really say it looks boring Sure, the first half is kind of slow, but you can't tell me that the second half doesn't make up for it I mean, I almost cried. What the fuck, man? After that, I watched Dora and the Lost City of Gold, and you already know how I feel about that. Followed that up with Aquaman, something I promised myself I would not watch, but here we are. From what I had been hearing, it sounded like just a fun and innocent time, which to be honest is exactly what it was. This movie doesn't give a single shit. It simply exists for you to consume, enjoy in the moment, and move on. You are not supposed to talk about it past that point. And to be honest, I respect that. I respect a superhero movie in 2019 that instead of trying to prove itself to be something more, just doubled down on what it knew it was, a dumb, fun flick. So basically, I have no idea how to feel. It's simultaneously the best and worst thing ever, and I have no intention of thinking about it anymore. After that, I watched a film that I should actually talk about more called Still Walking. This is directed by Hirokazu Koreeda, someone who is quickly becoming one of my favorite filmmakers. He directed Shoplifters from last year, as well as Afterlife and Like Father Like Son. And Still Walking is basically an entire film about grief and guilt through the perspective of a family reunion. The camera is very static throughout the entire thing, and a lot of the energy of the film is captured through the script and performance. It is a very moving and peaceful film that tackles this subject matter in a very gentle way. Next I watched Brigsby Bear for the first time, and guys, I'm so sorry, but I didn't like it. I loved the story and the characters and even the humor, but the direction felt so voiceless. I feel so bad about it because this film does, at its core, have a lot of heart to it. It is a really pure film. But for some reason, I just felt so bored watching it. It felt like someone put everything into the script and then gave it to a computer to make a movie out of it. There were some great jokes and some 
emotional moments that would have really hit if it weren't for the camera work and editing that felt like it simply did what it needed to do rather than doing anything special. I'm really sorry. I know this film means a lot to some people. I get it. I respect it. But it was just a bit underwhelming for me. After that, I watched Jigoku, a Japanese horror film from 1960 about hell that, to be honest, I only knew about because Gaspar Noé recommended it. And it makes total sense that a director as disturbing as him liked this because, yeah, this thing got disturbing. It's a real thinker if you're interested in death and religion and all that jazz. My favorite part about it are probably the colors. If you like the original Suspiria, you're gonna love this. Then I rewatched Synecdoche, New York, and I cried. More on that in a few weeks. After that, I finally got around to seeing High Life. It was physically impossible for me to see this in theaters because it wasn't playing anywhere around me at the time, and after watching it, I'm just a lot angrier. This thing is not only visually stunning, I mean, I loved pretty much every shot and how it captured the awesome production design, but it's also just a moody film. The atmosphere is dark and unnerving, something that I can imagine was just even more intense in a theater setting. According to Denis, this is her most heartwarming film, and it's apparently at its core about love. That changed much of how I looked at this thing. She takes something like love, something that to me is codependent with time, and places this quote-unquote love story in a setting like space where one could argue that time doesn't exist for our characters. Not to mention our characters are in a position where instead of prioritizing work, they prioritize love. Denis blends all of these ideas and uses them to ask how crucial love is to survival, and gives us enough to not really have a clear answer as we shouldn't. Yes, that was a direct copy and paste from my letterbox review. I can't believe I'm gonna review this, but the new Travis Scott documentary on Netflix is really not great. Kind of funny how a year ago I made a video essentially praising him and now I'm doing the opposite. There wasn't really a story or structure to it, it just felt like random pieces of footage tied together and edited like a music video. A music video that lasted like an hour and 20 minutes long. I mean, you would think a behind the scenes look at one of the biggest artists in music would be kind of interesting, but this was just boring. I also just don't think he's there yet in terms of like fame where he should have a documentary like this. Like he's three albums deep, let's calm down. Anyways, if you're a Travis Scott fan, I guess give it a watch, but if you're not, I guarantee you will gain absolutely nothing from watching this. I finished off the month by rewatching Raiders of the Lost Ark, the first Indiana Jones film. I mean, what is there to really say about it at this point? It's a classic, that car chase scene is one of my favorite action scenes ever. If you haven't seen it, what the hell are you doing? So that about does it. Sort of a slow month looking back at it, but we'll get them in September when I go to TIFF, baby! Anyways, thank you. If you want to hear even more extended thoughts on movies, listen to my podcast on all platforms, be on the lookout for some new videos soon, and uh, bye!